And I think we, we got uh, last presentation, we got uh, first time the hint about the talent and capabilities of Michel as a skiing uh, sportsman, so not only a scientist. <laughs> The next presenter is Rabbi Shlomo Vilk. He is Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Machanaim in Efrat and served as the rabbi of the Emek Refaim congregation in Jerusalem. Rav Vilk studied at Yeshivat Karnei Shomron and the Hari Fischel Dayanut Kolel and received ordination from the chief rabbinate of Israel. He holds a BA and an MA in Jewish philosophy. Previously, Rav Wilk spent several years on Shlichut in Toronto. Please. Thank you very much and good evening. I think uh, any great pr person in history had many areas and fields of knowledge. And in many cases, there was needed more than one person to, for the continuation of this, uh, of this person. In this case, and uh, just uh, Ariel just spoke about it, I think that in our family, everyone is trying to take, to grasp something from uh, our uh, parents, from uh, Michelle and Claire. And uh, one of the topics that uh, I'm interested in because of my background in Judaism and philosophy is the field of ethics. So, uh, and Michel, as you saw, wrote a few books and uh, is discussing ethics for many years now, and he was a part of the team that wrote the ethical uh, code uh, for the UN even, I think. So I'm trying to just give very, very brief introduction to the ethics about uh, reproduction uh, uh, techniques. Now, the problem with uh, talking about ethics in our days is uh, I'll mention three problems that we have. One is the problem of the modern era, which completely out of any other era in human history, is something that we cannot predict the future. And uh, the challenges of technology and the modern knowledge and ethics are beyond any comprehension ever. Like, it's something that we don't have enough knowledge, enough uh, uh, tools to judge and to think what really uh, ethical, uh, ju ethical judgment is. That's the first problem. The second is that until the modern era, let's say 1850, there was a divine ethics. People with divinity knew what, what ethics is. God talked to the Pope or to the rabbis and gave them by Moses, by Jesus, by Muhammad, he gave them the knowledge, and when someone who was in charge of the divinity in the world, whether in any, other, in any religion, knew what is right and what is wrong, and usually people had no access to the knowledge and no ability to argue with it. So, so e e ethics was quite easier than today. And the third problem is that I assume that when uh, Shoshi, my wife, spoke about Goshe, most of you knew nothing about Goshe before the lecture, and some of you know now a bit more. Some of you probably even never heard the word Goshe. And when Ariel spoke about uh, infertility, so more, more know about it because it's more common, it's not a disease. But still, you can't, in, in most cases, you can't argue with Ariel because he knows better than us. And the problem is that I know nothing more than you do. Because in ethics, everybody has a judgment. Everybody has something to say about it. And in most cases, and you all, I'm going to talk about a few problems, all of you have something to say about it. And in most cases, you're right. So in this sense, the there reason, because in a, in a, if you take, uh, I don't know, someone, if you want to discuss uh, infertility, you take a few doctors. If you, take, if you want to talk about, I don't know, international affairs, you take a few diplomats. But if you want to talk about ethics, you can't take people who deal with ethics. 
you need to take people who are lawyers and doctors, if it's in our area, uh, doctors and uh, uh, professors of, of ethics and law and uh, uh, society and the feminist and chauvinist and whatever. You need everybody to be uh, presented in the committee because otherwise there is no ethics and there's no way you can judge without uh, 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 understanding the whole uh, uh, issue of what you talk about, because if you learn ethics or philosophy and you know nothing about the field you talk about, there is no use of talking about uh, any ethical judgments. So, so now I'm going to talk about the problem, some of the problems. And uh, if it was, uh, if we had more time, you'd have the opportunity to argue. But uh, luckily me, you don't have the opportunity. This is what we do in the committee. But uh, otherwise here, I'm going to give my understanding. And since I'm part of the committee, as you see here, uh, part of the committee of, uh, of uh, the Ayala Association, Israel Fertility Association, uh, for several years now, I think 10, almost 10 years now. Uh, so I'm not talking on behalf of the committee. I'm talking on behalf of myself and my opinion, my ideas, my contribution to the committee, not necessarily the papers, uh, I'm not talking about the papers that we eventually uh, present to the committee, the right committee in the Knesset, in the parliament, Israeli parliament. Now, if we, if we talk about, uh, if we talk about uh, problems of fertility, I, I would like to, to start with the story of the handmaid's, handmaid's tale. I assume all of you, or some of you, or most of you, know the book and the TV series that uh, came after the book about Sipura Shel Shifcha in, in Israel, okay? And Sipura Shel Shifcha is actually about problems of fertility. And uh, as some of you know, even in the, in the, obviously in the book, uh, I saw only one chapter of the, of one episode of the, of the movie, of the, sorry, of the series. But still, this is a crucial problem because when we go back to, to talk about the ethical uh, view, the ethical uh, 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 challenge of the ancient era, and when we go to Genesis, the book of Genesis here, so we see that people had problems of fertility, and it was, it was much easier to use by surrogate mothers, okay? They take the handmaids, uh, and the handmaids uh, were two, two of the family, of the family of uh, Jacob. Uh, he had four wives, and uh, two of them were surrogates, actually, mothers to the main two uh, mothers, Rachel and Leah. Both had surrogate mothers, surrogate uh, uh, wives to Yaakov and uh, to Jacob, and I think in the movie, at least uh, I know in the in the book, this is what the this is the verse that the verses that the chapter in Genesis that the whole book is about, and uh, the book was written way before surrogacy was uh, uh, was an option, uh, but still it was uh, like a, a prediction. Uh, of, of the future because now we're facing it and uh, as you all know we had demonstrations just recently about demonstrations in Tel Aviv and throughout the country about the problem of uh, surrogacy. Pundekaut in Hebrew for those of you who don't know the word. Um, so if we, if we think about the past so we, we, are, we know that it was quite common because Abraham also had surrogate, a surrogate wife, okay, because Hagar was the surrogate for Sarah, and in Jacob's time, so probably this was the, the way people deal with uh, infertility, or even with, even with the will of kids, even if you're, not, if you're fertile. Most of the handmaids, we know from the Talmud, and from the Torah actually, most of the handmaids uh, were taken also for, for work, for slavery, but in 90% of the cases probably, they were taken also as surrogate mothers. They had kids for, the, for their owner. This is what's written in the Torah. And they had to bear kids for, the, uh, for their uh, master and mistress. So this was the custom in the old age, in the old age that your kid, your child, 
it was never belonged to you, and if you, if you happen to be a handmaid, so there's no way, even if you go out and, f- and you're free after a few years of, of, of slavery, your kids don't go with you. They belong to the, to the owner, to your previous owner. So this is how it used to be in the past. And the Torah even mentioned and, and say that if you take a handmaid, it's better for you to take her also as a wife. So it's, it was not, it was even a mitzvah, a commandment to take the handmaid and to bear kids from her. So this is how it used to be at all times. So this book and this uh, TV series actually goes around it and say that if we are very, we're coming to, we're very close to an era where infertility problems are going to, are increasing in those days because people are not getting married in a, in a, in a, in a very young age. And there are many problems that we don't know why. Ariel mentioned here 10% of the cases, we don't know even why a couple are infertile. And uh, the numbers are going up. And when the numbers are going up and fewer and fewer women will be fertile, so then this is why actually we have to deal with it and see because the world is most of the kids, in the, in the, in, in, not most, but many, many kids in Europe uh, are being bought from IVF and from surrogacy and not from uh, heterosexual relations. This is, the, this is, what, face, this is what we're facing, uh, what we're facing now. Now, if we, if we go back and see and ask the question, what is a parent? So for us, it's very easy, right? Parent is someone, is, is someone who had kids. But nowadays, it's not so simple because there are many kinds of parenthood, not only one. For example, well, the obvious one is the biological one. The owner of the egg and the sperm is the uh, parent. But in our days where many people are having egg donation, many women, or sperm donation, so who the father is, who the mother is? We're not sure about it. The law doesn't sure about it. Uh, 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 the halakha, the Jewish law, is not sure about it. We're not so sure about who the parent is. And at first, when uh, egg donation and sperm donation was started, was uh, just the beginning, so they thought that the owner of the biological material is the parent. But uh, now most of the rabbis and most of the, of the law system in the world don't think so anymore and say that the one who's giving birth is the parent and not necessarily the one who gave the uh, sperm. And we, we, even, we even have a precedent in the, in the Talmud for a case like this where there was a sperm donation. Uh, the, the Talmud says that one of the ancient sages uh, uh, was Ben Sira. Ben Sira even wrote a, a, a book like Psalms, uh, like with poems. It, it's part of, 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 uh, of, it used to be part of the, of the, of the Bible. And uh, he was, uh, he was uh, conceived from the sperm of uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, because he took a bath and some of his sperm stayed in the bath and his mother came, she never knew who was before her, and she was conceived for a sperm that was left in the bath. That, that's what the Talmud says. So we have a source about sp- uh, a, a sperm donation at least, and the Talmud says that Jeremiah was not the father of Ben Sirah. So in a sense we can say that we have an evidence at least uh, that even though it's, I don't think it's, it's possible, uh, this tale, but still, even if it's just a tale, probably it's just a tale, but still we have a source that our sages uh, uh, had the conflict of who the father is, and eventually they decided that the father is not the donor, but the, uh, the, the one who gave birth. And this son, this son that actually was, bo- this, in this case it was a son, but this child who was born from a sperm donation actually is what the Roman law uh, declared, Nullius filius, a son with no parents, a son without father. There is no legal father, uh, and there is only mother because she gave birth. But according to the ancient law, not the Jewish law, but the ancient uh, universal law, someone who was born from egg donation or sperm donation he is completely nullius filius, which means that he is he doesn't have any parent. According to Judaism, to the Jewish halacha, to Jewish law, there isn't such a case where we always, we always want to find someone who is a parent. The nearest one who 
the closest one who is around will be called a parent no matter what, even if he contributed the uh, biological uh, material and, and uh, if he gave birth or even, you, you're not going to believe it, but if a mother declares at the time of birth that someone is the father, halachically is the father no matter what. Okay, so if, if she declared, that's the father, because we want every kid to have a child, to have a parent. Every child must have a parent, no matter what, because we don't want kids out in the streets with no parents, like it used to be the old ages, and even now in South America, or in India, you probably saw the movie, about how many kids don't have any parent. In, in Jewish law, there isn't such a case. Every child must have a parent, no matter what. So in a sense, so uh, uh, if you ask a rabbi who the parent is, he will say all of the above. Okay, it's not, you don't have to choose, but if there is someone who is uh, biological, someone who, is, uh, uh, who gave birth, so the second is evidence. So uh, we'll take the parent as someone that we have evidence that he is the parent. In what sense? If a woman gives birth, birth, so it means that she is the, the, the mother, no matter what. Even if she says, I was just surrogate mother, I, it was never, it's not my, my, my husband's sperm, it's not my egg. Uh, I had, a, uh, I don't know, I have a, a, an agreement with someone that I'm giving him the child, he will have to adopt the child. Because, halachically, and according to international law, in most cases, the one who gives birth, no matter what, because this is the only testimony we can testify that she is the mother because it's very simple. She gave, she gave birth. She gave birth. And still, he, uh, the couple that actually will have the child after uh, surrogacy will have to adopt it because even if it's their sperm or, or egg, because we will follow the evidence, the fact that she is the mother. Uh, the third is uh, nurture, which means the caregivers. That uh, the Chazal are saying that someone who, uh, a teacher who is teaching someone, is also considered as parent. So if someone is, is growing someone, someone is helping someone, someone is nurturing someone else, a child, he is considered halachically, according to the Jewish law, as partially a parent, as he is, he is responsible for him, and he will, according to some of our, of, our, of our sources, even in the next world, in the Olam Abba, he will judge not only for the sins of his kids, but also for, also for the sins of uh, those he taught and never followed him. So the responsibility of nurturing is great because you're uh, partially a parent. And uh, the last one is law. Obviously, we have adoption. And adoption is a declaration of the law of the state that this is your child, and if you sign, it's, it's, your, it's your kid. Okay? But obviously, if you think about it, which is, in your eyes, the real parent? Like, if, I, if you have to circle one, which will it be? The one who gives the... So, it's very hard, but if you test it in, in the society, and go, for example, to the street and see how many kids were abandoned by, 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 the, by, the, by the parents. How many kids? So you see that the, the connection between parents and kids is the strongest when someone gave the biological uh, material. Because I was, I was just recently, I was involved in a case where someone was born in Russia from uh, surrogacy, and by the age, age of 14, he was unbearable. His mother couldn't hold him. He was really peri Adam in Hebrew. He was very wild. And uh, she kicked him out of the streets. And uh, when the police came and said, it's your kid, you can't, you have, you're responsible for him, you have an agreement, and she refused to, to, to take him, and there was no way, she said, he's not my kid, I never wanted this kid. And uh, the averages, or statistically, we know that in most cases, more abundant people, I'm, I'm not saying that this is common, but I'm saying that the connection is stronger where you feel that it's part of your body. The biological connection is stronger than any other connection, obviously between uh, teachers and students, and uh, even between parents and uh, surrogate uh, kids that were uh, born from uh, adoption and uh, even surrogate uh, uh, sur surrogacy. So this is uh, very interesting because when we talk about ethics, we ask ourselves, is it really a child? Is it really someone 
will you really be a parent? Because we don't want kids to be, to be uh, born into adoption. That's first choice. It's very hard to say it. But in other case, on the other side, there's no choice. This is what we have to do. So in most cases, we'll say that obviously uh, the default is that a child will be born from uh, his parents and the one who gives birth will raise the kid. But in many cases, it's impossible. So if it's impossible because the parent is incompetent, so we will uh, we'll manage, we'll give him to, uh, uh, to uh, adoption. But to bring kids into the world that the, the one, that the, he has many parents actually, the one who donated the egg, the one who gave uh, birth, the one who donated the, the sperm, it's not necessarily, the, obviously it's not the same one, and uh, eventually the one who is uh, holding or raising the kids, this is something that we don't want it to be uh, too common. Okay, but on the other end, we don't have any choice. Now, uh, if we talk about uh, if we talk about uh, uh, all kinds of methods, so IVF, that uh, just Ariel spoke about it, uh, we spoke about sperm and egg donation, we have a few problems. First of all, and I will talk about the Jewish law and about the law in general, uh, there is no intercourse. And when there is no intercourse, the question is, for example, is this child, let's say a uh, married woman was given sperm from someone, from a foreign person, men. Now, according to, uh, at first, according to Christian, Christians, Muslims, and Jews declared that this child is a bastard because married woman who had child not from her husband, the son is, bas is, a, is a bastard, according to three religions. So it was a big problem at the beginning. And the condition in Judaism was at the beginning that first of all, no married woman will be will accept will will have a sperm donation. So if she wants to have a child, she has to divorce first. Or if not, she can have a child from someone who is not Jewish because if someone who is not Jewish uh, uh, had sex with a Jewish woman, the son is not a bastard according to the law. So if she, give, if she, has a sper if she takes sperm from someone who is not, Jew uh, not Jewish, so there's no problem of, uh, of, uh, of bastard. And, uh, and Christian said also from a Jew. So it was, uh, it was quite easier. We can exchange uh, sperm and uh, it's, uh, it's a nice... Uh, uh, agreement, and uh, now most of the poskim, most of the in uh, in at least, I don't know about Christians now, but about Muslims that we sit in the committee together and Jews uh, in in uh, most of the of, of the Jewish uh, rabbis and the Muslims will say that is not a bastard because only where in a case where people had intercourse, this is the only way because we don't judge about. The, the, the child, but about the fact of sleeping together, about intercourse. If they had intercourse, this is what brings bastards. But if she is not, uh, there is no adultery, so she, uh, the child is not a bastard. So now it's much easier for a married woman to ha have sperm donation. Uh, but still in Israel, uh, for different reasons, uh, 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 it's preferable to have uh, sperm from, from outside of the country because of problems of relatives, because it's a small country and you don't know who will they meet and, uh, and so on. And probably you saw the movie Starbuck, you know, the movie about someone who had 350 kids from sperm, sperm donation. Uh, you know, probably you saw, maybe you saw the movie. Uh, so now there's a limit uh, of only five kids, but uh, it's very easy to overcome this uh, limit. So we prefer in Israel, many people prefer in Israel to have sperm from outside of the country. And uh, two other questions that are uh, unique to Jewish law is, first is the pidyon, pidyon aben. After 30 days, you go to the, the minister, to the Kohen, and you have to do pidyon aben. Like there's a ceremony, 
And uh, if the child uh, is, uh, was given from an egg uh, donation, so we're not sure that this is her child, whether it goes by the donor of the sperm or by the, the mother who gave birth. So we don't know what about pidion. And uh, now we don't do pidion to a child like this. We don't do the pidion because we're not sure about who the mother is. Uh, there is a halachic discussion about it, but I will not uh, talk about it now. And uh, in Jewish law, probably most of you know that in Jewish law, in order to, to follow the, the, the um, uh, commandment of fertility, you have to have a, a, daughter and a, a daughter and a son. You have to have two kids, at least, uh, uh, one daughter and one son. So the problem is that in IVF, for example, in many cases where people have IVF, they want after they have one child, which was born naturally, naturally like from IVF, but still uh, with no uh, PGD, and uh, they want to have uh, they want to have uh, the second one. They have to they want to have a son, or something like that. So the questions are whether is someone who, let's say, his wife uh, ha had to use a sperm donation, and the child is not his, but he will raise him. So is it the fulfillment of the commandment of f fertility? Is, growing, is nurturing someone considered as uh, the, the law of fertility? We don't, we're not sure about it. But still, someone who cannot have kids is, uh, is, uh, is not, uh, it doesn't have, uh, uh, the uh, obligation to have kids, so it's easier, but some people want uh, to have kids, so this is why uh, people go to IVF in a very uh, uh, old age, because they want to try and do, and do it by uh, naturally. Now about PGD, that's the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, this is a big problem, because in th those cases, and we have to... Uh, 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 we are presented as a committee of many couples that they want to choose the sex of sex selection. They want to choose the sex of the fetus. And this is a big problem because uh, we, we know what's going on in the countries where people have uh, any methods of sex selection. Uh, Shoshi told me once, uh, Professor Shoshana, uh, that spoke before, she told me that she was in a conference once and they said that the, uh, the technology that changed the uh, uh, humanity in total was ultrasound. Because ultrasound actually may, uh, enabled people to know what the sex uh, of the fetus is. And in many cases, they bought uh, 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 girls. So we have in many countries, in Saudi Arabia, in India, we have many, many, many more uh, boys than girls. So we don't want it to be here. So in PGD, usually, not usually, always, we will not allow sex selection, but in some cases we have to. One is when uh, the, the family has a child uh, with autism. Autism is eight times more in boys than girls. And if they have one child who is, uh, who is, uh, with autism, so we will allow them to ask for a girl, okay? Sex selection for a, for, a girl, for a baby, for a girl, baby girl. The second thing is where it's, uh, we have a problem of, again, it's very unique to Judaism because in PGD, in many cases, if the father doesn't have a sperm, so if, if, if you have, and there's a coin, so if, and he is not fertile, and if you, ha if you will have a boy, and everybody will know that this boy is not his because the boy is not Kohen. So we're allowing families with Kohenim to choose a sex selection for, bo for girls. So if they want to hide it and not, don't want the society around them to know their neighbors, so we allow them to choose girls. And the third one is when in Arab societies, when, uh, when uh, Boys are very, very important, more than girls. So also, in, in some cases, very, very rare cases, we will allow them. I must tell you, oh, there's another case where when you have four, uh, four kids from the same sex and you need to do P PGD for another kid, you can choose the sex. If you, want, if you have four boys, you can choose a girl. And if you have uh, girls, you can choose a boy. But you won't believe it, from 300, over 300 cases that came to the committee, 
of four boys, four, uh, four uh, from the same sex, the two different sex, uh, only 10% were where they had four boys and they want, and they want girl. In most cases, if they have four, four boys, it's enough, they don't want a girl. But if they have four girls, they want a boy. And the percentages are the same. So even in Israel, you know, it's not in the world, worldwide. It's in Israel, still people uh, prefer boys than girls. And uh, so it's not, uh, so this is why it's so, even in Israel, it's a very delicate issue. And I don't have much time to talk about grandparents, but grandparents is a big issue because uh, I have one of my students uh, left some sperm and he died from cancer and the parents uh, wanted the child, the grandchild, and this is a big problem, you know, every week in, a, in an Israeli court there is a problem with it. Uh, whether who the, who the, uh, in many cases the, the grandmother wants to be the mother. She wants a surrogate, surrogacy, she wants a surrogate mother to, have, to bear the kid and she wants to raise him. She wants to raise him. In this case, the Israeli court will not allow it for, for a grandmother grand, uh, grand, uh, to be a mother. But otherwise, as a sperm donation, and this is what they do now, uh, the parents are looking for uh, someone who wants uh, a child and grandparents, grand and they have some agreements, and eventually, and in Israel there are many, many kids, this year, 2018, uh, sorry, 2018, uh, over 200 kids were, were born from, uh, after the death of their father. So this is the rates now, and the rates are going up. Soldiers, someone who died in car accident, someone, uh, uh, cancer, uh, some people who died from cancer for other disease. So the numbers are going up. Uh, and uh, for many women who, are, who need uh, sperm do uh, d donation, it's, very, it's a good uh, thing because they don't have only a child, but also someone to support them, the grandparents of the disease. But in many cases, I know that there are many problems with uh, the grandparents and the parents. Uh, so uh, and the, last, uh, the last thing, very briefly, about surrogacy, uh, the considerations are very, very deep and uh, it's a big problem. I am in the committee, uh, I am uh, for the rights I signed and I wrote, uh, I even published, that I am uh, I'm supporting the rights of homosexuals to use surrogacy, but on the other hand, I think that it's a very problematic uh, procedure because uh, all the details, all the information we have uh, that was presented to us in the committee was that it's, a, it's not far from the, st the handmaid's tale. It's not far from uh, using women, uh, human trafficking, uh, people, people, women usually from the lower uh, parts of society will do it. It's not very far in many cases, in many cases from prostitution, uh, but there are many cases that it's, it's done uh, 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 with uh, cautious and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with, in a right manner. But uh, if we will wait for the right manner and only for, uh, for uh, altruism, uh, surrogacy with altruism, there will not be surrogacy in, in the world. Okay, it's not the case. It's not going to happen. Uh, so eventually, we will use women that don't have any other choice but to sell their kids and the connection between a woman, even if it's not her sperm, not, not someone's familiar sperm, and not her egg. She is attached to the kid, and they have many problems, psychological problems. It's very, very delicate thing. So on one hand, we have to allow it. I'm sure and I believe we have to allow it, but we have to put restrictions that I'm not going to put out now, but very, very hard. Now the question is, for example, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and this is the, uh, sorry for not using the laser pointer, but still, uh, I'll give you an example. That this is the discussion in the committee right now, is there is a model. And she doesn't want to give birth because she doesn't want to uh, become fat, or uh, I don't know, to have whatever. And she's a model, that's her profession. She has enough money and she wants to have surrogacy. What's the difference between someone who is barren, someone who is infertile, someone who is homosexual, and someone who is a model and uh, she's rich and she doesn't want to have kids, she doesn't have time, she wants someone to, 
uh, bear uh, surrogacy and raise the kids until the kid until the age of three and then give it give him. What's the, what are the differences? It's very hard to understand. It's very hard to define. Uh, we have a definition, and we talk about the inability uh, versus uh, uh, in willingness. So if someone can and doesn't want, this is where we will not allow surrogacy. But if someone cannot, and obviously if she is infertile, the couple are infertile, it's very easy to say, okay, we we'll allow it. The problem is with homosexuals, because I believe, and I, I'm dealing with uh, homosexuals in the, in the religious uh, uh, group in Israel very much, but some say that this is their choice. God never created you, or nature never gave you the ability to have birth. Since nature never gave you also the ability to have sex with a woman, so this is what nature chose for you not to have kids. This is the main idea of those of the Israeli law now, law that says that homosexuals cannot use surrogacy. But on the other hand, the problem, in my eyes, this is the issue, because for homosexuals, the problem is that nature never gave them the ability to procreate in the in, in the in the normal way, but nature never took from them the will to be a parent. So in a sense, this is also inability. It's not a choice. And since they want to, be, they want to have kids, so I think we cannot uh, uh, say that there are differences between problems, medical problems and whatever, I don't know how to call it, even not as a problem, but many, uh, uh, prob uh, problems of infertility that are not, uh, you can't go to a doctor to solve it in a natural way. So this is at least my, uh, uh, my opinion, and this is, obviously, uh, I hope so, this is, it's gonna be the paper that the committee will, uh, will publish next week that actually is supporting, is supporting homosexual surrogacy, with the restrictions, we will write all the restrictions inside, uh, and this is going to be presented to the committee in the parliament uh, when the parliament will begin right after the high holidays. Thank you.